I looked around and I saw machine guns being mounted all around us. Some of them were also carrying automatic rifles. There was silence. The next thing is, we started shooting. And my father was lying not too far from me. His eyes were open, but he was dead. The chain of events that led to the deaths at Asaba began years before. British colonialists created Nigeria by cobbling together many once independent territories, each with its own culture. In 1960, when it gained independence, Nigeria was home to over 200 different ethnic groups, the largest being the Hausa Fulani, the Yoruba, and the Igbo. Fears that one group would dominate led to ethnic tension and corrupt elections which set the stage for the overthrow of civilian rule by a group of military officers in January 1966. Many northerners saw this as an Igbo power play. There had long been resentment against the Igbo, who had embraced Western education and become leaders in business and civil service across the country. Attacks on Igbo people erupted across northern and western Nigeria that May. A counter-coup replaced the Igbo head of state with Colonel Yakubu Gawan in July, and the killings escalated into systematic massacres, which the Igbo called pogroms. Thousands of Igbo fled to their ancestral homes in the East and Midwest, including Asaba. By early 1967, the governor of the Eastern region, Colonel Emeka Ojukwu, was arguing that Igbos were no longer safe in Nigeria. After political negotiations failed, he declared the sovereign state of Biafra on May 30th. Soon after, civil war broke out. Located on the west bank of the River Niger, Asaba was never part of Biafra, remaining part of the multi-ethnic Midwest region. It was a quiet town, its population now swollen by the arrival of refugees from the north and west. The war came to Asaba in August 1967, when Biafran troops crossed the Niger Bridge and invaded the Midwest. They quickly spread west, overrunning Benin City and coming within striking distance of Lagos. Federal forces quickly regained the initiative, retook Benin City in late September, and pushed the Biafrans back to Asaba. On October 5th, the retreating troops crossed back into Biafra, destroying the bridge as they left. Federal troops under Colonel Murtala Muhammad arrived late on October 5th, striking fear into the townspeople. Soldiers began going from house to house, rounding up men and boys suspected of Biafran sympathies. Somebody came looking for my brother-in-law and said that the federal troops had come into Asaba, and they were burning houses. That if, and we opened the door and tell them that no, fed, no Biafran troop was there, that the house would be burnt, everything would be burnt. Soldiers gathered people together, 
and executions began. A man, a young man, maybe in his early, late 20s, early 30s, came with his wife. The wife just had a new baby. Then sitting where we were, the man with the baby, a soldier came to him and said, what did they do here? What did they do here? He didn't say anything. So he said, take that baby, give your wife, tell, him, tell them bye-bye. I said, move. He got to and said, moving. And as he was moving, he was starting to look at the soldier, you know, telling him to move, like, where do you want me to go? And the man pushed him at the back with the gun. Put him at the back with the gun. I said, move, move, move. Say one Nigeria. So he, the guy put up his hand and said, one Nigeria. I would just say the crack. Bop. And right there, they shot him. The wife didn't say a word. And I said, everybody, police station. That everybody should go to police station, apart from the old people, like my grandmother. So myself, my dad. Uh, I was walking behind him all the way. But then, just about two kilometers down the road from my house, <laughs> we, I saw, we saw two corpses with their heads blown off. People, these white government church people, you know, one of them with a bell, the other one with a lantern, still burning at that time. So that was the first sign to we got that there was trouble. Uh, you know, so that, that sent shivers, you know, down our spine. And so we got to the police station and there was a huge crowd. And, and then the police station, you know, come around, you know Mr. X, Mr. B, you take us to his house, you'll be free. You know, they had names they wanted to kill. And once in a while, they pick somebody from the cloud, go to the back of the house, and they hear gunshots. My husband and the brother, and all those about 400 people who were following them, they were shot at the police, in front of the police station at that side of the game. I held on to the person I saw, the soldier. I saw that. I said, Why did you kill my husband? I said, I don't want to remember what happened. I said, Why did you? The man with the butt, uh, the butt of the gun hit me on the chest. If you, my, my, uh, woman, if you are not careful, you get killed as well. From that point, I went home. I got home to tell them that they had been killed. Papa, that's my father-in-law. When he heard that his two sons were killed, he went out. And before, they, before he would go out to say, what happened? Shot him. He killed him. On October 6th, in an attempt to end the violence, leaders summoned all the townspeople to a peaceful march, pledging loyalty to Nigeria. On the morning of October 7th, thousands of men, women, and children from every quarter of Asaba joined the parade, singing and dancing. They came with the normal Asaba way with a gong, announcing that people, that the soldiers are already in Asaba, killing people, that if we can come to welcome them and declare peace with them, that we're with them, they will be spared. Started hearing, you know, dancing group. Mm -hmm. uh, one Nigeria, one Nigeria, one Nigeria, one Nigeria. Uh, so along the line, you know, I said, okay, let us go, myself and my cousin. So as we are coming out, you know, towards the road, that time the group, the dancing group, have, you know, they were around Then soldiers surrounded them. We are guiding them. Mm. That is Nigerian soldiers. We are carrying guns. But they lined up and said, women here, men here. And women who came with their sons were removing their skirts and blouse to disguise. Mm. So when I saw this scenario going on, and I felt something is wrong. If these women can disguise their children and my mother is not here, what do I do? And I looked at the whole place. There is no avenue for escape. They took us to a certain quarters and the, eventually the man was a captain. He ordered them to start shooting us. Gunshots. People were falling. So when people fell, I fell with them. And they continued shooting and shooting and shooting. I lost count of time. I don't know how long. After some time, there was silence. And surprisingly, a lot of people stood up from, from all the bodies and fled into the bush. I stood up also, but I saw a cousin of mine who was lying not too far from me. He was shot on the head. Um, my body was covered with blood, but I knew that I was safe. Nothing had happened. My cousin said we should wait till it was dark so that we could go together, and I agreed. You could hear the, the 
the sound of the injured crying. That evening, some women were able to retrieve the bodies of family members. Joseph Nwaje lost two brothers, aged 17 and 12. Mom in the evening was able to identify their corpses, took them in a wheelbarrow, pushed them to the family house. Where they were buried. Never saw their corpses. Never saw their body. But most were buried in mass graves with no opportunity for required ceremonies. Although I was so small, I could remember that what I saw were lifeless bodies. My dad was among those people that buried the dead. He left the house with shovel, then this sent leave, put it in his nostril that we enable them to stand the, the stench there. It was after when they have decayed, you know, smelling all over the thing that the people there gathered and then dug a common grave and they started putting them there. There are so many, I cannot remember, so many, so many. Many townspeople ran into the bush or across to the east but troops remained in Asaba, and the threat of rape hung over the remaining women and girls. They were forcibly married by soldiers. I have an auntie who was married forcibly by soldiers. Children were raped, and also even old women were raped too. Yeah. And even when they see that you are a young girl, they will falsely take you as their wife. That is, if you don't want to. As people trickled back, they found the once thriving town deserted, houses burned and everything of value stolen. home to enter, no house to enter. Our house was burnt down, everything. In fact, where we went, we had to be tying, you know, the bags they put, they put rice and beans. That's what we tie because there was no clothes, there was nothing for us to, to hide our so nakedness. A lot of children, kwashioko, or, you know, people were dying just like that. Some, we, we ate rats. In fact, as have exactly how many died on October 7th is not clear. Between 500 and 800 seems likely, in addition to hundreds killed in previous days. Many families were decimated. My immediate elder brother, the one following him, and one of my cousins, three of them were killed. You need to know who my husband was. Harmless, no, couldn't harm, couldn't harm anybody. He liked life, he liked himself, he, liked, he was a, a lovely man. And they just snuffed him off life like that. was my favorite brother and he was 
outstanding as a, as a student. He was captain of cricket, captain of soccer. He was a sprinter. He was a sprinter and he was in the Nigerian 4 by 110 meter, 100 meters relay team. So it was a, a great loss, you know, um, to the family. Um, of course, one tries to forgive. And he was a teacher, a darling father. He, you know, we looked up to him so much. He was everything to us. And he wanted to bring his children up to make sure that they had education. I want people to know, because not many people know what happened. Even my own children, because God knows why I had to survive for me to have a story to tell. And that's what I'm telling you now. For decades, the massacres at Asaba remained almost unknown outside the community. In 1967, the Nigerian press was tightly controlled, and few foreign news reporters were on the ground. In the words of Nobel laureate Wole Shoyinka, the Midwest Igbos had become the most vulnerable Nigerians. The war itself became internationally famous in 1968 after the federal government imposed a blockade, starving Biafra into submission in 1970. The silence began to lift in the mid-1990s, and some survivors testified to the 2001 Nigerian Human Rights Violations Investigation Commission, known as the Okuda Panel, which set the stage for more people to speak. It was for us the first opportunity uh, that we're going to have to even air the matter. But the, uh, the aim was really to begin something by way of a healing process. If you wrong somebody and the person has an opportunity to talk, to talk about it, uh, assuming you, you, show an act of, you show some contrition, uh, you apologize, or you go some way into alleviating their, their pain and suffering, then the healing process can begin. Four decades after the war, Asaba is a busy state capital looking to the future. Yet the scars remain. These are visible in the derelict buildings that remain unrestored and on the bodies of those who survived. And they are invisible, borne by Asabans who have kept the memory of the cruel deaths of their fathers, brothers, and uncles. The people of Asaba do not want retribution only to tell their story, allowing the massacres to become part of Nigerian collective memory. After the war, the then head of state, the state general government, said um, that the war was a war between brothers, no victor, no vanquished. Okay. But what happened in Asaba wasn't a war. There was no fighting going on in Asaba when the federal troops got there. No fighting whatsoever. Those that they killed were not soldiers. They just took them and lined them up and killed them. Even in the history books, in the military history books, there's no mention of it. It has got to be part of our history. Because if you don't have a history, you really cannot go ahead, go, go ahead in life and go ahead properly. It's got to be part of our history. Nigeria is a mix of so many different people, different tribes, languages, religions, everything. I was born into this entity called Nigeria. I am proud, very, very proud, to be a Nigerian. But so also, I am very proud to be female. I am very proud to be an Igbo woman. I'm very, very proud to be an Asaba woman. This country belongs to all of us equally. Nobody should be made to pay any, pri any, 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 pay any price that is way beyond that which is necessary to keep the country going. We paid more than a necessary price during the war. Asaba makama o, asaba asaba makama o. Iko ha asaba makama o, ike ya ni bunjo bioma o.
Ahabama kama o o o o Asaba asaba makama o Iko ha asaba makama o o o Kenya ni bunjo biama O ya o ya o ya O ya o o o o Biano ge kili 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 o ya o Manachuku asiko kozi anio Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh 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 oh. Kile 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 oh yeah, no. Manachuku asiko gozi anio. Ah, bagoli ben ninjo biama. No makaya liba kachuku juwe fu anya anya. Ebe chuku si anya mafuzi oh yeah no wancho zono. Don't go see before you lie in the noa. Abama kama o. Asa wa sa ba bonye ma o. Ipe ha sa ba ma kama o. Ipe ha ni bonjo bia ma o. Asa ba ma kama o. Asa wa sa ba ma kama o. Ipe ha sa ba ma kama o.